Hello and welcome to Sex Unwrapped, a podcast by Saving Lives UK, with myself, Tom Hayes, a Saving Lives trustee who's been living with HIV for 10 years, and Dr. Naomi Sutton, an NHS consultant and star of Channel 4's Sex Clinic. Sex Unwrapped is a podcast exploring everything sex. Together with our guests, we'll be exploring sex, sexuality, sexual health and sexual pleasure. Basically everything to do with sex. So slip into something more comfortable and let's go. So um, first of all, I'd like to say a massive thank you to Karen. So we've got Dr. Karen Gurney, who's also known as the Sex Doctor on Instagram. So she's a clinical psychologist and psychosexologist on a mission to improve the sex lives of the nation. She's a recognized national expert in sex and relationships and works for the NHS and is the director of the Havelock Clinic. As part of her mission to educate inform, and inform, um, she also challenges widely held ideas that harm people's sex lives. And she's done her first TEDx talk and wrote her first book, Mind the Gap, which is about truth and desire and how to future-proof your sex life in 2020. So first of all, Karen, I've read the book, I have it here. For anyone who hasn't read it, it really is fantastic for anybody who's in a long-term relationship. Um, so can you just start off by telling us why did you write the book? Sure. And hi, Naomi. And thanks for having me here today. It's really exciting to be here on Saving Lives, Sex Unwrapped. Um, I wrote the book essentially because as a clinical psychologist, um, I've been working in HIV, sexual health, sexual problems for 20 years. And all of the work that I do as a clinical psychologist is essentially behind closed doors, mostly one-to-one sex therapy or talking therapies or perhaps couple therapy, but all kind of behind closed doors. And around about 10 years ago, I realized that most of the problems that people were having with their sex lives were nothing to do with those people themselves or to do with the relationship that they found themselves in, but were everything to do with what happens outside of the therapy room in terms of what goes on in society. So the way we think about sex, um, the way we talk about sex, the way we frame what good sex is and what normal, in inverted commas, sex should look like. And I thought this is crazy because I have, I spend all of this time fixing problems within people that aren't within people. And actually the problems that need to be fixed are within society. So I kind of made it my mission to take my uh, sex therapy knowledge and um, everything that I'd learned out of the therapy room and started that on my Instagram account at the sex doctor and got really good response from people saying, we really like this. It's really helping our sex lives. And as a result of that, I was offered uh, the book deal and to do a TED talk to reach a wider audience. So that's kind of where I started from. And um, the reason I started with Mind the Gap, which is obviously a book about desire in long-term relationships, was because it's desire that presents most frequently to sex therapy. It's the most common reason people come to sex therapy concerns about desire or mismatches in desire in a relationship and surprisingly it's also the the difficulty that's easiest to resolve and so um, there's this huge gap between what people actually know and what people could do with knowing and so that's why I wrote Mind the Gap and I'm glad you like it. I do well that's very reassuring that it's the easiest problem to solve because um, I, I guess where do our assumptions about desire come from? Mm. Oh, I love that question. Okay, so a combination of things. Um, Sex science, as with all science, um, is really patriarchal. And so um, when sex science exploded in the kind of 50s and 60s with Kinsey and Masters and Johnson, it was really groundbreaking and they did wonderful things. And really that's where sex therapy came from. But it was all based on models of sexual response that were really for um, cis straight men that's who they based their sexual response models on and everyone else kind of had to fall into that even though they had data to say that for other people things happen differently they have sex differently their way their body responds is differently is different um so really it started then uh, with a, a lack of understanding of the diversity of people's sexuality uh, and it was based on that kind of cis heteronormative model and then since then it's really just been replicated in the constraints of language so the fact that we use language like foreplay which is the most ridiculous word which basically means any sex that isn't 
um, a penis in a vagina is not real sex or doesn't count as real sex, which is obviously um, really undermining the sex lives of queer people and uh, people that just prefer not to have that type of sex. So the use of language really um, continues to replicate some of those old ideas. And then there's also the influence of uh, religion and the influence of gender politics and the influence of history telling us things like, you know, sex is really for procreation. It's not really for fun. Um, and, um, you know, the gender politics telling us this is how you should be during sex. This is your role. This is what you should look like. This is what's important. So all of those things really act as a prison for our sex lives. So how long did it take you to write your book? Because it, it's, it's no small feat to, to write a book, especially one of this depth and this, the amount of research that must have gone into it. Um, oh gosh, how long did it take? I actually did it in about six months and I was really nervous about that because I had my NHS job um, and my, my other job to do at the same time. Um, but actually, I suppose one of the things that really excited me about writing the book was that most of it was just in my head. It was just all swimming around in my head. And when I first started to write it, I was surprised at how quickly it just kind of all came out. Um, so yeah, it took about six months and I won't say it wasn't a huge challenge. And um, a few people have said, will you do another one? And I'm, I, I say, I don't know, but <laughs> you have to ask my wife whether she would be happy for me to do another one um, because it does take its toll. But no, it was, it was probably about six months. In the book, you talk about um, normalizing desire, and we talk about you talk about how different kinds of sex, other than heterosexual, heterosexual, parentive sex, have been kind of othered. When do you think that really started and became the societal norm? A lot of people blame it on the uh, sort of the Victorian era and the Victorian ideals. Does it go back further than that? Because obviously, if you go further and further back, those kind of relationships were part of societal norm. You know, when did we? get so stuck in our sort of 1950s gender roles and our, our sexual roles? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, Tom, because I think there's been a real, there's been fluctuations over the course of history with how sex positive we've been in the West. And I think it's also important to note that across the globe, there have been communities and cultures which have been hugely sex positive. And some of that has also been totally squashed by colonialism. Um, and I think that one of the things that's quite interesting to note is that um, Wednesday Martin actually wrote a brilliant book about this, that part of the kind of way we see sex now is really linked to the acquisition of land and the idea of marriage and family structures being a way that land is then passed down through generations and that we, uh, Wednesday Martin's book, Untrue, is a brilliant account of how that kind of led us to be quite conservative um, and start to see women's sexuality, particularly um, through those constraints. But I think, you know, it's fascinating. There's been so much change through history and it, it actually isn't all bad. Do, do you think, how long do you think it will be before we, I guess, get there to this, the elixir of having good sex without being so bothered? Or do you not think we're ever going to get there? I do think we'll get there. I think we're really far away from it at the moment. One of the things I notice is that there's a huge sex positivity movement happening on social media. And I think, you know, people talk a lot about the dangers of social media, but social media is also a place of great change. Um, depends who you're following and what you're looking for, doesn't it? And certainly on Instagram, there's a massive sex positive movement. And I really see the, the, the seeds and the beginnings of real change around how we talk about bodies, how we talk about gender, how we talk about sexuality, how we talk about sex positivity. But what I would say is that there's a dramatic difference between what I see in social media and what I see in the therapy room with the people that come to see me. And, and actually that, that change that's starting has got a long way to go before it filters down into our kind of everyday life. Um, and still people feel hugely constrained by ideas around uh, how they should be in their sex lives and what their sex lives should look like and I think we've got decades to go before we get somewhere with that but I, you know I think I think we're getting there. Yeah I'd completely echo that I feel when I'm when I'm looking on social media I'm thinking yeah this is great and people are really positive but then when I go to work it's like a, it's almost like a, a a different world you know people yes. look at their vaginas 
or touch yeah. themselves or you know and the and and also I, I think as well as medics I think you know we say when was your last sex and we presume that means penis into vagina which is dreadful you know we, we need to change as well I think as a whole body I think everybody needs to change and, and I think outside of the sexual health world you know GPs and other healthcare physicians need to start asking not about when your last sex was but was it good sex you know did you enjoy it have you got any sexual problems because I think there's a well there's a wealth of sexual dysfunction isn't there that doesn't present because we're not asking and people feel awkward about um, I think presenting with problems like that don't they absolutely and we know that around 50 percent of adults in the UK are concerned or dissatisfied with their sex life or have a sexual problem and a much much smaller amount actually present to services to say that they need help with that and yeah. it is really important because I think often people think of sex as something really trivial they think of it you know about kind of scratching a physical itch or something that's just for fun and of course it can be both of those things wonderfully so but it it also you know it's really important for our psychological health for our uh, relational health um and for our well-being and it really connects to all, all aspects of who we are our sexuality so i think it would be great if we could start normalizing conversations about that and and as you say i think there are lots and lots of healthcare systems whereby people are going to present with sexual problems more often, you know, thinking about cardiology and diabetes and in cancer. And um, it would be great if we could normalize having conversations about sex in those places too. Yeah, completely agree. Yeah. And, and I, I know you're a stats geek as well, but you know, the, the, when you're saying these things, that's the NATSAL study, isn't it? 50%. We know these things because of questionnaires and studies. We're not just making it up um, absolutely the, yeah the link between a, a good healthy sex life is linked with just emotional well-being isn't it and it is action and depression and you know all these things have um have a knock-on effect yeah absolutely yeah and i'm a huge stats geek yeah, um, and yeah the, the natsal data is so wonderful because it's you know the biggest the yeah. biggest survey in the world happens in the uk about what happens in people's sex lives and we should be immensely proud of that i think and of course the next one is is happening soon it happens every 10 years and i can't wait to see what's shifted from the last one how do we get people to understand the differences uh between a romantic desire sexual desire and you know how that is important how that plays into our lives you know mm. how, do pe how do we stop people confusing um perhaps the, the casual one night stands they have and what they see on in pornography with their ideals for what a relationship should be further down the line yeah so i think it's good to start off by thinking about how desire works and um, of course in the with casual sex or thinking about sex with new partners, we know that the type of desire that people experience tends to be um, quite lustful, quite dramatic, quite all encompassing. It feels a bit obsessional at times and that's really normal. And we see that for the first couple of months to year of having sex with the same person. What happens then is that um, a different kind of sexual connection is formed if we continue to have sex with that person. And the desire can feel uh, less powerful and less spontaneous is the key thing, but also other things come in its place. There may be kind of a, a building of, of trust or connection or intimacy. You may feel more relaxed in their presence, for example, because they've seen you naked a thousand times. But what tends to happen is that people interpret that change in desire as a drop in their desire for that person because it suddenly feels less obsessional it feels less out of the blue and actually it's really normal and we know that for people of all genders they see that change but it's worth saying that um, for uh, for people who identify as female they'll notice that le more they'll notice a bigger drop in their spontaneous desire and it's normal after being with someone for a year year and a half thereabouts to suddenly find that you very rarely think about having sex and that your desire needs a little bit more work so it needs to be a bit more triggered and that's often the point that people start to worry there's a problem with them or their desire because they don't understand how desire works and that actually um, their responsive desire the desire that needs to be triggered by being with that person being physically intimate being sexual having cues for desire like flirting or passionate kissing 
that desire works just fine. But what happens when you stop feeling it out of the blue is you start to avoid those things a little bit. And so desire shows itself less and less in your relationship. Now, when you think about porn or when you think about um, casual sex, you've always got in those scenarios an injection of novelty because that's essentially what those things are. And that's why they're so wonderful because our brain loves novelty. When it comes to sexual arousal, um, our brain hates things to be the same and it actually stops seeing things as a sexual stimuli when it's the same all the time. So that's why when I work with couples and it's important to say here that um, when, I, when, when I'm working with straight couples, um, they tend to suffer the most with having sex that always looks the same. So we know that um, in queer relationships, people are very good at mixing it up and for it not always to look the same way. It's not always predictable. But uh, when women and men have sex together, often it can start to be a bit A, then B, then C, and then that's the end of it. And that predictability is terrible for desire. So that's why porn and casual sex can be so good for us because they offer an injection of novelty and excitement. And they also allow us to be who we want to be because in a relationship where you know somebody quite well, they kind of know what you're going to do next or they know you a little bit. They they have a view on how you should be sexually because they've got to know you. And one of the things that's really freeing about casual sex or about uh, solo sex or porn is that you can really just be who you want sexually. And that's why sometimes it can be super, super exciting because you get to be who you want to be. You get that injection of novelty. But sometimes what people don't get are other things that they value like trust with that person. Of course, you can have trust with someone you've just met and you can have intimacy with someone you've just met. But for some people, they need to build that over time. So I think for everyone, it's just about knowing what works for you. And for some people, casual sex is the hottest type of sex. And that's all they want. And that should be celebrated. And it's great. And for other people, they actually really like the familiarity that builds with a known partner. But they just need to be aware that desire will change and it's good to know about that so that you don't interpret it negatively well, that's your question tom yes that was that was an incredible answer well, <laughs> thank you what i love karen as well is that you you don't talk about sex drive because i know a lot of people get that confused you know that we're supposed to have this inherent sex drive and your sex drive is higher than mine and whatever but you talk more about desire which i think mm -hmm. i think it's really important for people to get their heads around um, it's something that we can cultivate, isn't it? It is. All of us can. We can have desire feature as much as we want in a relationship once we understand it. And you're right, Naomi, there, there is no such thing as sex drive. It's not something that we just have, like hunger, that's just there. That's one of the real myths about sex that sex signs quashed around about 15 years ago now, and society hasn't caught up with it. That we know that, um, you know, unlike hunger, where the less you eat, the hungrier you get, sex doesn't really work like that if you kind of don't have sex for a while actually you're quite happy going with going without sex for a while and um it how it works is that uh, we should think of desire more of a motivation than a drive so basically uh, are we drawn towards that thing or that person are they sexually exciting and alluring to us and how rewarding will it be to have sex with them will i get pleasure from it will i feel good after it about myself um, will it be a fun experience? Um, and what else should I be doing with my time that I have to put on one side to have sex? And uh, if I can, you know, put my stress and my tiredness to one side, uh, then all of those things come together in us feeling like being sexual. But that's where it can go wrong for people, really, on those different levels. You know, how alluring is that person to me? Um, you know, do I feel connected to them? Um, do I find them attractive? Um, do I see them as a sexual being or have we stopped being sexual together and it's hard to see them that way? And how rewarding will it be? Um, is it going to be pleasurable in terms of orgasms, but also just in terms of pleasure more widely? And am I going to feel good about myself afterwards or am I going to feel bad about myself afterwards? And then lastly, what else should I be doing with my time? And a lot of people are really preoccupied with um, distractions from you know being on their phone from work stress worry about other things and 
for a lot of people, those distractions just really get in the way of their motivation to be sexual. So once we start to think about desire in those ways, it also gives us an indication of what might need to change if we want our desire to be different. And what, what I always love talking to psychologists is that we can control it. So I think sometimes people feel completely out of sync and just don't know what to do. And I think, you know, I mean, one, your book's really good, but what if someone was sitting, listening to this and thinking, blimey, you know, I've been married to my husband for 15 years, we've got kids and, you know, we have sex once a year, whatever. Like how, how do people start to take back that control and start to, I guess, reignite the desire? Yeah, well, there's obviously quite a lot that comes into it. And obviously the first thing I'm going to say is read the book because it's all in there. But if you couldn't read the book, um, then I suppose the first thing I would say is at the very least, a good place to start is to experiment with your responsive desire because most of the time people are just waiting to feel like it and they never feel like it because their spontaneous desire has diminished, which is quite normal. And so waiting to feel like it makes you feel like you've got a problem with your desire. Once we tell people, and in your case, this is a, um, a woman who's been married to a man for a long time, you're saying, once we tell people that actually women's desire works responsibly just fine in a long-term relationship, then I would say to show yourself that and to prove that to yourself, experiment by seeing what happens if you listen to some audio erotica, you know, apps like Furley or Dipsy, see what happens if you watch some ethical porn, you will notice that your desire builds. You could also, you know, if you don't feel like doing those things, you could see what happens when you watch a good sex scene on TV. You will probably notice some feelings of arousal in your body. The problem is, is that you may not feel motivated to act on that desire with your partner. And that could be because there are other things getting in the way, like sex has become a bit predictable, like your pleasure uh, is perhaps diminished and actually you get more from masturbation. There could be many things. Um, you've stopped relating to each other in that sexual way. You've become a bit more like co-parents or flatmates over the years. And then all those things will need addressing. But I would say on a very basic level, just start by reassuring yourself that your desire works just fine, because then that gives you the confidence to think, OK, hold on. I thought I was broken. I thought I had a problem with my desire, but actually I don't. My desire works fine when it's triggered. So how are we going to trigger it? What changes do we need to make? And sometimes you have to experiment with that alone to feel confident, because in my experience, most women particularly, um, think there's a problem with them and there really isn't I love that that's great it's about communication as well isn't it so um, I think we're, all of us are probably in a relationship at some point where you know we've been we've got to a point where we are in the mood but like how do I how do I start this conversation or you, you try to mm -hmm. hint at it and your partner looks like they're busy engaged in television or they're not in the mood yes. or Perhaps you want to try something new in the bedroom, but you don't know how to broach that subject with them without perhaps being embarrassed or it being awkward or them rejecting your idea. So yes. it, it's, it's, but so much that is tied to your self-confidence, isn't it? To be able to start these conversations, because sometimes even if you've been with that person for five, 10, 15 years, it's still a, sometimes an awkward thing to, in the middle of, I don't know, Lord of the Rings go, do you know what? I really fancy sex right now. You know, should we go upstairs? <laughs> it's still a, so Sometimes some even harder yeah. the longer you've been with them. I mean, I'm, I'm glad you raised that tongue because I think communication is, is a really key point here. And we know from sex research that sexual satisfaction in a relationship is um, more reliant on being able to talk about sex than it is on anything else. So frequency of sex doesn't matter. Um, lots of other aspects of what you would usually think of as sexual satisfaction, like, you know, orgasms, for example, nothing really matters as much as being able to communicate about sex. And it makes perfect sense because our sexuality is constantly changing the things we're into, how our body responds, what we like. We're always wanting to look for new things because our brain likes novelty. And unless we build a culture of being able to adapt um, in our relationships, to our changing sexualities, which of course has to be about talking, then it very quickly can stagnate and we can start to feel a bit like, oh, I quite like to try that, but I can't say that with them. Or I'm actually a, a bit bored of that. Or, you know, since I've had 
I don't know, this operation, I actually don't like that anymore. There could be many different things that change. And I often talk about the importance of creating a culture of being able to talk about sex in your relationship. And I would say that um, for anyone who might be listening, creating a culture of talking about sex, all it takes is regularly talking about sex. And then it becomes part of your relationship culture. So I suggest to people that um, building in a regular time to do that, whether it's, um, you know, often I get my clients to start having a kind of sex film night once a, once a week, once a month, where they take it in turns picking a film that's well known to have a good sex scene in it. And all they have to do is enjoy the film and afterwards talk about what they thought was hot and what they didn't like so much in the film. And that's just a way of keeping talking about sex in your relationship and keeping that culture going. But it also provides a really non-threatening way of saying, I actually quite like that. And letting the other person know that without having to bite the bullet in the middle of Lord of Rings and say, have you ever thought about pegging? Um, <laughs> which can feel like a bigger risk. So, so that's one way to do it. And what's great about a culture is that we can change cultures by how we are within systems. And so all we need to do is start talking more. It won't feel easy at first, but the more you do it, of course, the easier it gets. As we can all say, because we work in this field and talk about sex all the time, and the more you do it, the easier it is, right? Mm -hmm. So that's what I would say is, is to think about a culture of communication. But for people who perhaps haven't created that culture and they do really want to bring some change into their sex life and they want to do that right now, then um, my kind of key formula to recommend for people to do that in a way that can go well is to pick a moment where you feel quite connected, even better if you're not looking at each other like you've gone for a walk together or something and start the conversation with the things that you appreciate about your sex life. So, you know, I've been really thinking about our sex life. I really like the way we X or Y, or I really feel good about Z. Start it with that, then follow up with, um, I, I've really missed, you know, we stopped doing this and I miss that a little bit, do you? Or I've wondered about this um, and then let them know what you think the benefit would be about doing that thing. So I think if we did that, it would be really hot and, you know, it'd be really exciting to try something new together. I think it would make us feel a lot closer and then put it over to them. So what's going well, what you'd like or what you miss, what the benefit would be for both of you of bringing that in and then put it over to them for their thoughts. But it is hard because we're not socialized to talk about sex as a society. And so we have to kind of go against our instinct and create that culture. And another, another thing that um, really struck a bell with me was, um, you know, if you feel that you're broken, so you feel that you don't have that desire, you, you withdraw from situations where you might think it's going to lead to sex. So, for example, you know, if you're having a cuddle on the sofa and your husband or your wife kisses you and you're like, mm, you know, you turn it into a peck. But you your your thoughts were well just let that kiss happen and see what happens to your desire because yeah. often, you know if that's triggered then you'll feel more comfortable so it's almost I guess not withdrawing from situations which maybe will then lead to sex but allowing them to happen I think a bit more yes and I was I was just saying yesterday to somebody actually that if I could create one change in the in the nation that would have the biggest effect on people's sex lives in long-term relationships I would say turn up what I call sexual currency as high as you can so all the things that aren't having sex but are things you do with a sexual partner like flirting sexting passionate kisses glances bum squeezes in the kitchen um suggestive looks all of that sexual currency turn it up as high as you can and turn the pressure for it to lead anywhere down low because the mistake that a lot of couples in long-term relationships make is um the sexual currency goes right down there's almost nil and the pressure when there is a kiss is turned right up so it has to lead somewhere and so as soon as someone as you say Naomi um, kisses you on the sofa your first thought is they want sex and I don't feel like it right now and so you withdraw whereas when you create a culture of high sexual currency and you both know that's just about who you are as a sexual couple doesn't have to lead anywhere that's what allows your desire your responsive desire to grow and if I could make one change to everyone's sex lives that would be what I would do and you know I see it time and time again in sex therapy it just revolutionizes people's sex lives um 
but it does require everyone in the relationship to be on the same page. Um, and what's also fascinating about it is that it's not actually sex that makes people feel like a close sexual couple, it's sexual currency. And so people start to realize when they turn up the sexual currency, it doesn't actually matter how much you have sex because the reasons we have sex are often also met by sexual currency. You know, if you're, if you're motivated to have sex because you like to feel desired, having your partner throw you against the wall for a five second passionate kiss before you leave the house, it makes you feel desired. Yeah. That's it. You, it's, it's not as much about the acts of sex as we think it is. Yeah, I love that. That's brilliant. <laughs> sexual currency. <laughs> sexual currency, turn it up. So, so your book talks about um, 2020. We're now in 2021 and mm -hmm. we're still in lockdown. Um, just from your work and what you see on social media, how do you feel that the, the constant lockdown has affected people's levels of desire and their satisfaction with their relationships and their sex lives? Mm. Yeah, that's an interesting question because also the NatSAL team have done some uh, lockdown COVID research on this as well. So we do know a little bit about what's happening. And their research backs up what I see anecdotally and what I hear and have through DMs on my Instagram, which is a lot of people who are living with a partner are noticing increased relationship satisfaction from having a bit more unstructured time together. Um, I would say that's slightly tempered. The people with kids are obviously struggling a bit more because of the impact of lockdown schooling. Many people are reporting that they're just not feeling like sex at all that are living with a long-term partner and I think that that makes perfect sense when we we talked earlier about our brains liking to um to see our partners as a sexual stimuli and as being quite novel and when we're sharing our, the same space all the time and we're always dressed in the same you know jogging bottoms and comfy clothes it there's no trigger there to see our partner as a sexual being where there might be when they when we go out for a night out or when they come home from work or when we've not seen them for some time so so i think that's one of the reasons people are feeling like sex less um and we you know we also know that for plenty of people who are not living with a sexual partner there's a real kind of skin hunger and they're really missing having sex and that people are using more porn and having more solo sex as a way of meeting those sexual needs. But I think what I'm hugely interested in and uh, you know, my NHS clinic at 56 Dean Street, what we're kind of preparing for is what's gonna happen when lockdown ends. Because I think people have really missed being out and about and enjoying their sex lives. And we're gonna see, I don't know what you think as well, Naomi, but it, those of us working in sexual health, we're gonna, we're gonna see a bit of a boom yeah, well, yeah, predicted to be in the 1920s, but possibly worse with, but you know, it's understandable, isn't it? People just, it's going to be like a cork coming out of the champagne bottle. I think people are going to be <laughs> mad and crazy, but you know, done them. I mean, yeah, you know, for young people who were starting out wanting to be sexually active and they've just been, it, it must be really, really tough. Yeah. Yeah. We do, yeah. As a charity, we do quite a lot of outreach on places like Grinder and Scruff. And yeah, the amount of, um, Pent up um, desire waiting on those, those apps is um, not to be underestimated. Um, it's going to be quite something, isn't it? It is, yeah. And it's a, the yeah uh, testing services are going to be um, put through their paces, I think, come May. Well, a good thing while we're on the topic of testing is get tested before you go out there. So you know, make sure you're yeah. not anything. You know, so actually, lockdown is the ideal time to test and get everything in everything ready <laughs> it really oh, is yeah forget test it. and restart your prep if exactly. you're somebody yes. who's on prep yeah, yeah. get yeah. yourself ready. there's only a couple of months of lockdown left so now is the perfect time to give yourself a, a sexual health mot mm -hmm. and reorder your prep if you need to and yeah yeah get your free condoms and lube delivered yes and enjoy it yeah. It, yes, make the most of it because you never know when it's going to be another lockdown, <laughs> it seems. <laughs> well, well, I think what's, I mean, again, on social media, I kind of get this feeling, but but people are starting, especially women, are starting to learn about their own bodies. And I think that's really important to have time, you know, buy yourself a toy or whatever, but get to know your own body because you can't ask someone what you want sexually unless you know what you want to happen, really. So, you know, yeah. all the, you know, actually, and start how you mean to go on. Start talking about, you know, if you're going into a new relationship, 
as Karen, as you say, you know, start talking about sex from the start. Don't yeah. fake orgasms, you know, get to know what you want, you know, be a bit more. Dim- and again, I think that's really difficult when you're young because I don't think you have as much confidence. Um, that's right. Sexual confidence tends to grow with age, doesn't it? But I think that there is also that kind of social media revolution happening. And I think that's really giving people the strength and confidence to to do that, to be more vocal, to talk about the types of sex they want to have and don't want to have and not feel pressured into a kind of a first, second, third, fourth base norm. Um, And um, as you say, Naomi, for those people that are perhaps starting a new sexual relationship, coming out of lockdown, looking to meet people, it is a real opportunity to do things differently, you know, to start creating a culture of talking about sex from the outset to future proof that sex life, but also to think, okay, in this, in this relationship, I am not going to fake orgasms or, you know, I'm going to top even if um, I haven't before, because I've always felt like people don't think of me that way or, or whatever it might be, you know, it's the time to, to kind of try out new things, I guess. And, and even in a long-term relationship, you know, just again, try new things. I think it's, I think what pe- puts people off is the fear of rejection, isn't it? And the fear that you're going to be embarrassed. And especially if you've been with someone 15 years, it, I think it's much more difficult to then bring into the open, <laughs> can I peg you or whatever it is that you want to do. <laughs> um, because it's the fear of, of, you know, blowing that whole relationship up and thinking, yeah. you know, and, and, and you do get pigeonholed, you know, especially if you're a, you know, if you're a wife or a mother or whatever, you know, you play a role, don't you? Um, yeah. And I always say that, you know, we sometimes get caught up with the idea of novelty, meaning that it has to be, um, you know, like a latex or nipple tassels or whatever, which is totally fine if that's your thing. But when I'm talking about novelty um, and unpredictability in long term relationships, I don't actually mean those types of things, but they're fine if that's what you want. Novelty is really about it not always looking exactly the same. So if the sex that you have is always, you know, sensual and gentle, then great if that's what you like. But perhaps sometimes you'd like it to be frantic and rough. And that's the difference you need. Or if the kissing that you do is always one way, perhaps sometimes you'd like it to be different. And um, sometimes that's the type of novelty or sex that ends a different way or sex that happens in a different room. Or, you know, there are so many ways for it to be novel that our brain will really love that in terms of desire. And, it, you know, those types of things are perhaps not as hard to introduce with a partner as, you know, the nipple tassels and latex. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, final question. Um, if you could give a top tip to anyone to improve their sex and relationship um, today, what would it be? One simple tip that might, you know, get things going again. One. Oh, I'm going to struggle to narrow oh. it down to one. Let or you give us a couple though. if you like. <laughs> two. Can I do two? Yeah, of course. So the first would be um, learn as much as you can about how sexual function works and about how your brain and your body work together when it comes to sex, because that will really benefit your sex life. And you can find lots of that for free online, on Instagram and other platforms, um, podcasts like this. The second would be to practice talking about it. And if you're not in a relationship or you don't feel able to do that with a sexual partner right now, just start with your friends and find somebody that you trust and that you can start to talk about it and just get practiced saying the words, saying what you like saying what happens you will find that anything you're into or anything that happens for you is not at all unusual and of course um, buy and read mind the gap yes of course and enjoy it (laughs) (laughs) so where can people find you online karen so i'm mostly on instagram at the sex doctor um you can also find me on twitter i'm karen gurney five but i'm more active over on instagram awesome well, thank you so much for joining us. Um, Thanks Naomi, for having me. Any, Naomi, any parting words? No, just thank you ever so much. You've been absolutely phenomenal. Brilliant. Oh, it's been great to be here. Thanks, both of you. Uh, thank you. Enjoy the rest of your week. Thank you. You too. Bye. So that's today's show. Thank you for listening to Sex Unwrapped, a podcast by Saving Lives UK. Please remember to subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, SoundCloud, or wherever you get your podcasts.
Saving Lives is a UK charity committed to improving the sexual health of the nation. To find out more about Saving Lives UK and to find out where you can get a sexual health or HIV test, head to savinglivesuk.com. <laughs>